All right, ladies and gentlemen, these are the Latin American revolutions. Um, so previously, we've gone over the different revolutions. We've gone over the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and the Haitian Revolution. Today, for this lecture, I'm going to try to keep it short just by going over one of the Latin American revolutions, and that's going to be the Simón Bolívar Revolution that takes place in most of South America, mainly Venezuela, Peru, and then he actually teams up with uh, the men in like San Martín in Argentina as well. I'm not really going to talk about Mexico or Brazil at all. Now, while Me the Mexican Revolution and the Brazilian Revolution have their minute differences, we can make some generalizations here. So generally speaking, what's occurring in the Latin American revolutions, I'm sorry, what's occurring in the Simón Bolívar revolution is pretty similar to what's going on in the Mexican revolution and the Brazilian revolution. Let's go ahead and move forward, forward with our essential question. Number one is what were the causes and effects of the political and social revolutions during this time period? And why did nationalism begin to rise? And what were the positive and negative effects of this new way of organizing society? Let's go ahead and move on here to the Costa system. So this is actually very similar to what we saw when we looked at Haiti. We, when we were looking at Haiti, we saw the Grand Blancs, we saw the free people of color, we saw the Petit Blancs, and we saw the slaves. Well, within Latin American society, we have this Costa system that we previously talked about in Unit 4. We have the Peninsulares up at the very top. These were people born in Spain, and they, they had the most power, but they're still fairly upset with Spain in the same way that the Grand Blancs were up set with France. They don't want all these trade laws that prevent them from making a whole lot of money. The Criollos or the Crioles were Spaniards that were born in Latin America. These are very similar to the Petit Blancs in Haiti who saw themselves as being equal to, to the Peninsulares. They wanted to be equal to the Peninsulares, but they were never really able to move up through society. So they very much want to overthrow the Peninsulares in order to have more control of their society. Then we have the Mestizos and the Mulatos who are very similar to the free people of color in Haiti. They are, are not white and they are discriminated against, but they do have at least a little bit of freedom and they uh, can make a little bit of money. And then of course at the bottom we have the slaves and the natives who are just like the slaves in Haiti. We already went over Costa paintings in our previous unit, so I'll go ahead and skip that. What we see here are the issues with class. The Criollos resent being controlled by Spain, and so do the Peninsulares. The Criollos want to have their own political power um, that's held by the Peninsulares. So they really want to overthrow the Peninsulares. They want to overthrow Spain. They want to have more of a democracy. And once again, when I say democracy, I don't mean voting for everyone. The Criollos really just want to, they they themselves want to vote. They don't want to be told what to do by the Peninsulares. The Mestizos and Mulatos are obviously resent being denied equality to whites, and then the Native Americans and enslaved Africans resent working on the plantation. So everyone has a reason or a justification, justification to get into a revolution. But in order to have a revolution, you have to be organized around an authoritarian strongman in steps in Simón Bolívar. Now, Simón Bolívar was born in Venezuela, but made his way over to Europe and was educated there. As he was educated, he learned a lot about these Enlightenment ideas, but he also saw Napoleon. And he was inspired by Napoleon. I mean, this, this general who was able to spread the ideals of the Enlightenment by using the military. So when Simón Bolívar returns to Venezuela, that is what he wants to do. But there's a lot of things that happen in between all of that. What we see is that at, in 1815, Napoleon is exiled. Actually, we have to take a step back from there. Let's, uh, let's take a step back. When Napoleon was in power, he had taken Spain. Because he had taken Spain, Spain could not focus on its new world possessions. They had to go fight Napoleon. Because they couldn't focus on the new world, people in the new world, in those Spanish possessions in modern-day Venezuela, start to, started to form their own republic. Since there was no strong authoritarian government to put them down, they could form that republic. In 1815, Napoleon is finally exiled for the second time and stays exiled. Spain regains control of its land in Europe, but also its land in the New World. And so when Spain regains control, it goes to its New World uh, new world possessions and says, yeah, we're back in charge now. There's no more republic going on. But the idea of having a republic, the idea of overthrowing that monarchy was in 
it's inside the minds of the people. So even though Spain is in charge, people are thinking, how can we overthrow Spain? They exile Simon Bolivar, who had been back in Venezuela. They kick him out to Jamaica because they know that he is a very powerful leader and he, he was willing to use the army in order to overthrow Spain. While he's in Jamaica, he writes a famous letter called the Letter from Jamaica. He writes it to the British asking for their support. By this point, it's already 1817. The British have fought in the War of 1812, which we did not go over in class, but we'll go over. you will go over in AP U.S. history next year. Uh, and so the British say, no, we're, we've already defeated uh, Napoleon. We've already fought against the United States in the War of 1812. We don't have the time or the money in order to help you out. Simone Bolivar then writes to the United States. The United States was the other side in the War of 1812. So they write back and say, yeah, we can't help you out because we just had a war with the British as well. And so Simon Bolivar is kind of on his own, but he sends one last letter out to Haiti. And the government of Haiti says, we will help you. We'll give you guns. We'll give you support. But you must abolish slavery in Venezuela. Simon Bolivar says, absolutely going to do that. And so in 1817, he makes his way back to Venezuela. He organizes an army and he fights against the Spanish government. By 1822, he has taken over modern day Venezuela, Colombia, Panama, and Ecuador. Now, while he's doing that, there's another couple of guys who are fighting in Argentina. They are Jose de San Martin and Bernardo O'Higgins. And in order to show you this, here's, here's a map. So we have San Martin and Bernardo O'Higgins down here who are fighting against the Spanish to free Argentina and modern day Chile and eventually make their way all the way up to Peru. We have Simon Bolivar over here who is fighting through modern day Venezuela and fights through Colombia and all the way over to Peru as well. Eventually they meet up. Bernardo O'Higgins being an older man retires and so is Jose de San Martin, General Sucre and Simon Bolivar who will be the ones to finish out this revolution. They will finally take Peru and they will march into Bolivia and finally take Bolivia and in a great way to celebrate they go to the top of the potosi mountain and they sit there and they they celebrate they look over their land and the reason that i at least i think it's the best way to celebrate is that the potosi mine was the same mine that we looked at in unit four that had all of that silver that the spanish took out of latin america and brought back to europe in order to greatly benefit from it and buy chinese goods and all those things we talked about in unit four and this almost seems symbolic this finishing the fact that you have people who were born in latin america finally sitting atop the thing or the mountain or the mine that made their country so wealthy. Now they control the wealth of their own country, not the Spanish. So I don't know. I think it's symbolic. I think it's a great way to finish it all out. So ladies and gentlemen, that is the ending of our Latin American revo revolutions. Um, our next lecture is going to be on the revolutions of 1848.